first of all, uh, congratulations on the book. It's, um, it's only come out on paperback this week in Ireland. Oh, so really? Oh, great. Yeah, Perfect. it times in very well with, uh, with your... Uh, very nice. Here, yeah. yeah. It's good. Um, uh, I thought it, it... It's out in paper. I thought it... Uh, well, it's out in hardback in, uh, in, in out of London, so it just came out here, though. In paperback, yeah, but it was out, it was out in hardback before that. Oh, it just came out in paperback. Great. Yeah, that's great. right. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. Um, one of the most interesting things about the book was you, your dislike of the, the, the Oliver Stone movie. Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. You, unfaithful. You contributed, did you? Did, did I contribute? Yes, I contributed. Yeah. No. Uh, it at the end of the movie it says uh, special thanks to the Doors. Right. Um, there are other members of the Doors. I had nothing to do with ultimately that film. I, I read the script and walked out. I contributed to Oliver Stone up until the point when he delivered a script. I talked to him. I talked to Oliver Stone for two solid days, giving him, in effect, the gospel according to the doors. Right. I told him my book. I told him Light My Fire. Not the movie we wanted to make. Okay. We wanted to make, um, you know, some kind of an insane white powder movie. I don't know if you can say that in the newspaper. You might be able to get away with a white powder. What uh, does it mean, white powder movie? Well... <laughs> Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Sorry. No, oh, your editor will catch it. You'll know. Uh, oh, they'll know. Well, I got in trouble last week actually for mentioning drugs. And yeah, well, you I'm won't better, be able to mention okay. white powder either. <laughs> but a friend of mine saw the movie and said that's a glass pipe movie. Uh, okay. Yeah. You know, as opposed to a psychedelic movie. The right. film is not really from a psychedelic perspective. It's written yeah. from a... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you fill in the blank. Okay. <laughs> That's the problem with it. He wanted Sherbert to make respect. he wanted to make a story of. Uh, um, I, I think he was basically enamored of Jim Morrison's leather clad thighs. I don't know if you can say that. Either. Yeah, well, I'm sure we can. But you can say leather clad thighs. I think. You can say that. <laughs> Although I was censored on American radio for saying that. Really? Yeah. The First Amendment, but, oh my God. Well, the First Amendment, are you kidding? Who cares about the First Amendment? It's your sponsors. You know, sponsors are going to hear that and call in and say, I'm not going to sponsor a filthy show like that. Talking about leather-clad thighs just makes the hair stand up. Um, so Oliver Stone made a movie about uh, Oliver Stone. It's not Jim Morrison. It's Oliver Stone as a rock star, loosely based on Jim Morrison. I, 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 Val like Kilmer, kind of Val Kilmer, Gar Jim Garrison. Uh, yeah, Robert exactly. Jim what Garrison. he did, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, you don't need to change the facts. That's why I was completely shocked when I read the script. Like, he's changed the facts. Why change the facts? The door, the JFK story is a fascinating story. The Jim Morrison story, the, the door is a fascinating story coming from the beach in Venice Film School, Venice, California, psychedelics, opening the doors of perception. You know, struggling to make it, then making it, and then all the weird things that began to happen with Morrison and drinking and uh, his eventual demise in Paris. It's a fascinating story. The door is up against the establishment, fighting the establishment. He didn't want to do anything with that. He had the doors fighting amongst themselves yeah. rather than fighting the establishment. Because if he fought the establishment, that would be fighting Oliver Stone's beliefs. He went to Vietnam. We were anti-war. He went to Vietnam. Yeah. So... Twice, I think, as a matter of fact. Right. So uh, Val Kilmer does a very good job. I thought he played portrayed Jim Morrison very nicely. The music in the in the film is great, and the name of the band is correct. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> just about. Uh, <laughs> what speaking of Vietnam? What do you think of what's going on in Kosovo at the moment? Do you see the? Uh, no, it'll be no. It won't. It won't turn into Vietnam. It'll. It, it will. Kosovo will be over with uh, by the end of the summer. Right. Instead of a World War One, it would be over by by Christmas. Yeah. Well, that was when they actually ran it. That's right. They did say that. No, no, no. We won't get sucked into that again. No, no, no. As much as they would like to, as much as the ma the madness of, uh, of of that area, it, it's the uh, it's the confluence of Islam and Christianity. It's in a way the last battle of Islam. And Christianity is what's going on. It's a, well, and, and appropriately for the end of the twenty uh, the twentieth century, for the beginning of the new millennium, in which we finished two thousand years of Christianity. There's one last battle, and it's going on right now. It's Islam versus you know, so it's a holy war once again. So I don't think I don't think we'll get it. Uh, the holy war will turn into a World War Three. Right. I don't think anybody is going to really 
they start throwing bombs because of uh, the Kosovars, you know, right, and right. because of Milosevic. And, uh, um, and he'll, they'll get him out, because you know why? There are too many good people in Belgrade. Belgrade is like a very hip place, right. you know? It's like, why are, they go, why are the people going along with this? They're being isolated from the rest of the European community, and, you know? The, the very the intellectuals and artists and, and all kinds of good people, very intelligent people in Belgrade, a beautiful city, and um, they're, they've got to vote Milosevic out, right. get rid of him. And, and they, the end of the summer, it'll all be over by the end of the summer. Uh, yes? Have a cup of tea, please. Boy, I would like some water. I would like some water. And uh, you know what? Then bring me I an... Uh, water as well. Good. Yeah. Bring us two waters and bring me an uh, egg, tomato, and cheese sandwich. Yeah. Is that some brown bread? That would be nice. Yep. Oh, a glass of fresh squeezed orange juice, a small one. Well, whatever size it is. Orange juice? Yes. Yeah. Boy, it better be a damn good one, Ed. Are Irish pounds, are Irish pounds the same as English? Well, Irish pounds are actually worth less than English. How much? Um, it's 84 at the moment. In Irish it better be a damn one. In English. Damn good one. It better be a damn good one, hadn't it? it better be about one dollar seventy-five. No, dollar seventy-five for what? For an orange juice? juice? Oh, no, for no, 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 orange juice. juice. Uh, anyway, bring me a glass of orange juice. <laughs> Would you like I'll pay for it anyway. Pardon me. Ice with the water. Yes, please. Yeah. I'll pay well, for it anyway. American style. Very good. Um. On a completely different subject. Uh, so the war will be over. I mean, all the problems will be over. There will not be World War Three, and it'll be over with by uh, yeah, the end of summer. And there may be some skirmishes, and we may have to bring in troops for some peace. Somebody may have to bring in troops for peace, but uh, it'll all be over with. Right. But it's terrible. What do I think of it? It's terrible. I think it's absolutely horrible that we're starting on the road to repeating what happened in Vietnam. It won't go to Vietnam, but we're on the road to another Vietnam in uh, in you know, southeastern Europe. Madness. Yeah. Madness. Of course, he's mad, too. Course. Greater Serbia. Um, the idea of greater Serbian ethnic purity, is, that's insane, too, because the world, because of television, and uh, because of the, now the internet, and because of rock and roll, we are all one brotherhood of humanity, you know, regardless of race, creed, color, or religion. Last of the religious wars. Or that's one of the last of the religious wars. Do you think it's a pity sometimes that the world has become so small? No matter, no matter where you go, there's rock and roll culture, there's American culture. Well, you know what? That's the way it's going. I mean, right. uh, um, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do to stop it. I don't think right. it's a pity. I think it'll, I think it'll prevent uh, people from killing each other. You know, right. yeah. I think we'll be actually be able to have interracial love affairs without being castigated. I think right. a, a white man will be able to make love to a black woman and bear a child that will be simply a child of mixed race and, yeah. you know and I think uh, I think it's more important that we turn the earth into the garden of Eden rather than maintain our ethnic diversity as much as I love the idea of ethnic diversity because I love hearing African music you know and I love Chinese music I love the music the indigenous music of all the cultures I think it's better to live in peace and harmony in the garden of Eden which hopefully in the in the uh, 21st century, we'll, we'll begin to create the new Garden of Eden. Right, right. So just no time for that. Pardon me? Can we, take, can we get some shots? Oh, of course. Yeah, for, yeah, Lara, how's it going? Lara, hey, man. Hey. You won't go away. I can come back and I, just in case you were rushing anywhere. It's no big deal. No, 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 I'm here. When you are finished, I'll, I'll be hanging about. And when you all are right. finished, Did you see the other two are over there? I see them all. I'll avoid them, maybe. Oh, I don't know. I'll say hello. I don't know what to do. But um, when you are, it'll be a while. I'll come back. Sure. I'll be around the place. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, fine. Yeah. Great. Great. Okay, thanks, sir. Um, I, the funniest part of the book, and there's a lot, of fun, a lot of funny parts as well as tragedy, I think was well before the doors when you were talking about your first sexual experiences in the 1950s. <laughs> embarrassing as well as funny. Right. Um, I, I wonder. If Sex in the fifties. <laughs> uh, well. Don't you call it sex? Squat right. Squatch marks. Right, well, Bill Clinton didn't call it sex, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. why should I call it sex? <laughs> stain marks on the name. Exactly, of stain marks on yourself <laughs> instead of on uh, Monica Lewinsky's blue dress. <laughs> um, I, I wonder, do you think 
How much has America changed now since the 1950s? Is it, do you think it's very much more liberated now? Oh yes, absolutely. We were uh, uh, we had no idea in the 50s that there was such a thing as cosmic consciousness. Right. The 60s opened up the doors of perception. Yeah. In the 50s, you didn't know that there were doors of perception. We had assumed that our relationship to God was at its ultimate level. In other words, master servant, master slave, master servant. And there was no idea that you could expand your consciousness into the point in which you could you could join the mystics, you know, you could become one of the mystics. And it's no big deal. Being a mystic is no big deal. It's open to all humanity, all human beings. In a way it's the it's it's the ultimate aim of humanity, is the reuniting with God. Right, right. Becoming one with God once again, as we were at the beginning of of existence, you know, pre existence, and as we will be at the end of our existence, we uh, you know, we come into the energy and out of the energy. Right. You, you talked about that towards the end of the book. Mm -hmm. I wonder, do you, do you believe literally in uh, the Chinese way of addition of the old, uh, date of birth? And so oh, on? no, I don't. Uh, All right. It's, it's, a, it's a parlor amusement. Right, okay. You know, it's a parlor amusement. Right. And it could okay. be. Maybe it is. I'm, I don't know. I have right. no idea. Okay. It's not, it's not up to... Um, I've, I've never, I haven't had any experience of it. You know, I personally uh, um, don't necessarily believe in reincarnation. Right. I figure I'm a brand new soul. You know, although you know it says I'm a nine, so I've had nine incarnations. I have, I have no, uh, no memory or no uh, anything of, of past lifetimes. I, I really don't believe in that. I believe that we are the energy. That's what I believe. We're all the energy, and if we can experience within ourselves all of the lifetimes, all of the planetary, you know, it's all, we are the all, the all is us. The Indians say it, you are that. I mean, it's a, this is a classic uh, um, yogic, uh, Hindu, you know, Vedanta way of, way of looking at things, that we are everything and everything is us. So we can have an experience of all those things, but Ray Manseric having past incarnations, I, I don't really I, I, actually, I say no. I don't think. It, I don't think it really. really Do you happens. think it would have been noticed a lot more in uh, previous centuries? <laughs> God knows he was noticed enough in this one. Um, how, um, what, what was your? Maybe this is an impossible question to, to answer. But it, when you look back on the doors, what's your overriding memory? Is it? Oh, the music. The music. music. Yeah. The, the the intensity. The intensity of the creation of the music. Right. The joy of that intensity. Right. The joy in potency, as somebody once yes. said to me. Look at what, what a cute little thing it is. Look at this. My goodness. Oh, absolutely delightful. Like a delightful little lady sandwich. Oh, here, here, wait, wait, wait. This, we don't take that. Okay. Good. So the intensity of the music and the joy and the potency, the joy of that intensity and the joy of that potency, the creation, the four of us locking in together to create uh, the music is, is the uh, is, is probably the overriding memory. Right. And ultimately, that's you know that's the point of it. Yeah. What is the point of being a musician? Yeah. Making music. The point of making music is to lock into a rhythm. This is all the way back at the beginning. This is prime, as Jim said, would like to use the word primordial. Our music is primordial. Our music is primeval. In the beginning of time, when a man, you know, or something like a man, first picked up a stick and began to hit us raw and got a tone out of it, and then another one came along and hit a rhythm against that. So, dum, ka dum, ka dum. so you had two rhythms going on at the same time, and the guys looked at each other. Wow! <laughs> and then a woman started to dance, you know. <laughs> that was the beginning of it. We, the doors locked into that exact same thing. Right, right. And that's, that's the great, that is the great joy for me, the great memory for me. And that's the purpose of all music. Mm. However, I've got lots of, uh, you know, great gigs and you know, right, happy right. moments and then terrible moments with Morrison, God. 
you know, I can I could run off a, a list of a, a hundred joyous, great moments and a good fifty terrible moments with Jim. Jim the drunkard. Yeah. Um. Was there a lot of stories that you couldn't put in the book? You well, I, I just didn't have... There's not so much stories that I couldn't put in the book. I felt writing the book, I was talking to the reader. I mean, it was a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So yeah. I, you know, I mean, I felt I could... At this point, I can tell you anything. Yeah. You know, because it's between us. And that's yeah. how I felt. I was talking to you as the reader, each individual person. So there wasn't anything I really held back. It was just a matter of... I mean, I could have written uh, 650 pages on the doors, you know. I, I could have written, uh, you know, 200 pages on growing up in Chicago. Well, I had to edit that down. You know, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That became... <laughs> uh, I, somebody must remember the images came from growing up in Chicago. Oh, great. I'm glad you liked it. Mm. Mm. Yes, that was that was a great deal of fun. <laughs> um, well, why do you think that... Uh, you, you talked about in the book that you were able to kind of live both in the music and also in reality, the, rea the reality of making music and what you had to do to turn up for rehearsals and, mm -hmm. and take it seriously and all, but Jim was never really able to manage, well, especially towards the end, was mm -hmm. never really able to to live in both worlds at once. What, what, do you think it was your background that well, separated you in that way? That might, that might get into the fact of being a nine. Right. You know, numerologically, the Chinese astrological, you're nine times on the wheel, and Jim was at one, and I was in nine. Curious coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> I don't believe in it, but it's a very curious coincidence. Also, um, we were the, uh, um, the, the, the marriage, of, uh, marriage of opposites, the yin and the yang, uh, and, and Nietzsche's... Uh, um, Dionysian and Apollonian. The the artist marries those two impulses: the impulse of wildness and the impulse of order. And obviously, to be a painter or a musician, you have to be orderly. To create a writer has to create, but you also have to have a wildness within you. So that was the Doors. Morrison had the wildness. I had the order. We organize. You know, we married those two things and created a rock and roll band. But Morrison also had a touch of the shaman in him, the ancient shaman. And um, I think that maybe ultimately would ki what killed him. He, he looked death in the eye and was not afraid of yeah. death. Yeah. Whereas we're all afraid of death. No one wants to die. Morrison, in a way, gave up himself to that wild impulse. The chimbos, yeah. <laughs> and he was never able to bring it back because there was no there was no shaman, no older shaman. There is no shamanic tradition. You know, there hasn't been in the West in a thousand years. So no one's really lived the shamanic tradition in a thousand years. There was no older shaman to say, no boy, you're going too far there, otherwise you're going to die. So to be a shaman, you've got to be a wise, become a wise old shaman. And Morrison had that ability but just didn't have anyone to guide him out of that madness. And I was far too young to. Yeah. I mean, I could have done it today, but back then I was, uh, he was my friend. I mean, we were equals, you know? And I couldn't, as, as, as much of an older guy that I was to the band, I couldn't be a father figure. That's what it required. It didn't require an older brother. He required an actual father. And interestingly, his father was, he had an absentee father. His father was in the Navy, and uh, father was never around. So that lack of that father figure is uh, probably what contributed to Morrison's uh, unable to come out of that wildness, unable to say, that's enough of that, I'm going to die. Maybe I'll do it every once in a while, but I can't do it all the time. Consequently, he did it all the time, and it consumed him. Yeah, that's Um well, you also mentioned in the book uh, that you know you, you see doors, T-shirts, and posters on sale everywhere from Venice Beach to yeah, Venice. Yeah, right. Um, do you think that since the films come out, it's become a bit too commercialized? Do I think? Do you think that the, the image of the doors since the film has come out has become maybe a bit overexposed? Maybe? I don't know that it's become overexposed or too commercial. I mean, I, it's certainly become warped. You know, I've made a warped image of the doors. That's for damn sure. Uh, and as far as the Doors commercialism, um, I don't think the Doors have become too commercial. No, I right. really don't. I don't think the Doors are near, nearly as uh, um, 
I mean, we don't sell nearly as many records as uh, uh, the Beatles. No, I don't mean you. I just mean people, you know, just kind of ripping off uh, doors for T-shirts and... Oh, well, you know, everything. what the hell, they're going to do that. It's a cottage industry, you know, there's nothing you can do to stop that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care about that. Right. And I must say, I did like the fact of seeing Jim's image uh, hanging there in St. Mark's Square in Venice. Yeah. I thought, that's it, we've gone from Venice to Venice, we made <laughs> As we started off, we have to remember that all rock bands start off with nothing. And then you uh, you have you have dreams of performing your music in front of large gatherings of people who will dance wildly and madly in a Dionysian frenzy to your music. And um, you know, two thousand years ago, they would uh, you know they would give you a, a ham and a dozen <laughs> eggs, and uh, you would have food to eat because and, you know. And here would be a you know a jug of mead. You'd have some mead, and uh, you know if you were. Can you, you can imagine Celtic musicians. Well, what did the Celtic musicians receive? You know, two thousand years ago, a jug of mead and a ham and some eggs and you know to sustain you. Well, today it's you get little you know little bills, little pieces of paper. So um, you know, being being able to actually support yourself uh, from making music is. Right. Absolutely joyous. Do you get uh, bothered a lot by, I don't know if you have the expression in America, anoraks, call them here, like obsessives, doors obsessives? No, the anorexia nervosa is all I can think so think of, but it's an anorax? Anorax, like you know the type of quote, an, an anorak. Okay. It's a slang word. Oh, right, okay. People who are like really into one subject and... Right. So do we have that in, in terms of the doors? Yeah, do you guess? Sure. I mean, I can't think of any other band who must have more of that than, oh. than yourself. We have Jim Morrison fanatics. I, I get calls from, curiously enough, what's called the High Desert. In California, there's a... Uh, Los Angeles is a little bit above sea level. There's an area past L.A. to the east of L.A., east and south and north, where it goes up into the hills, and it's... Up, it's, a, it's baking hot desert, not the sandy desert, but more like uh, the Middle East, and it's, it's high, the elevation is high. And properly, that should be a place of great spirituality, but because of the times that we live in, there's no spirituality, there is a, a, there's a great deal of, uh, of crystal meth, I don't know if there's meth dream here, speed, a lot of speed heads up in the high desert. How they get my telephone number, I have no idea. They divine it out of the ether, I think. And they're always calling me to start the doors up again with them as the lead singer. God. Jim Morrison has visited them. You've got, we've got to start the doors, right? You guys got to get back together. I'm the lead singer. And it's always like insane paranoid. They're paranoid schizophrenics. And, you know, 2,000 years ago in Israel, they may or not may not have been followers of Jesus, and they more properly should be followers of Jesus, you know, and get rid of, and stop the white powder, get rid of the white powder, get flush that out of your body. But, uh, it's so good. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, those are some of the people that call me. <laughs> and it's scary, you know, because... You know they're insane. They've been yeah. driven insane by the drugs and by the desires. Just like those kids in Colorado that shot their stu their, their classmates and just said, God, this could be actually dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever worry about that? Some no. Mark Chapman kind of figure. No, Doris fans are really quite good. Yes. They're, uh, they're all good people. I used to worry about that, but not anymore. I found that uh, there's, a, there's a big there's a big change over, and uh, um, Doris fans are, for the, for the most part, very intelligent, right. very polite people. I mean, I figure they've got to be intelligent to get out of the doors in this day and age, you know, not not to blow our own horn or to be egotistical, but you know, if you're in 
at the end of the uh, end of the millennium and you're into the doors this day and age then you've got you know you've got some soul and some wit inside of you yourself and michael mcclure since, uh-huh. since the doors i mean you must be absolutely just blown off with people like me asking you what the doors all the time oh no, i love been, it maybe you'd be much more interested in talking about what you've done since not really that's no. fine no. i mean i like to talk about what i've done since but yeah. um, i have no objection well, because I get to say psychedelic. <laughs> then I get to see whether or not you can put that in the article. Yeah, sure. I know you can, but we'll see what your your editor has to say about that. Well, I had a bit of trouble last week because I wrote about UB40. Do you know that? Sure. And uh, during the interview, they gave me a lot of hash across <laughs> the table. So this caused a like, big thing that I mentioned. This it's the most interesting thing of the interview. So I don't know if the white powder will get in. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but the word psychedelic can get in. Oh, yeah. Because it's a throwback to, to, an, to an earlier, more innocent time. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you think that the... I mean, I, I don't know if there's anything left for fans in the States or anywhere to... In the States in particular, to rebel against. I mean, in your day, it was extraordinary when you talked about... Oh, you God. had Vice Squad on one side yeah. and, and, you know... The Marvel morals. On the, other, oh. on the other side. God. But that, isn't that what created the... Attention, if you like, mm-hmm. they built up the doors. Mm-hmm. Is there anything left? I mean, you think nowadays you got a president who's on MTV and he's talking about uh, the Grateful Dead and how much he liked him and he wore the, <laughs> you know, wore a Grateful Dead tie and all this stuff. You stuff. know what you could rebel against? War, killing, right. the dis- the despoiling of the planet. Mm-hmm. That's what's got to be rebelled against. Right. But to become ultimate followers of Jesus Christ. Not born again Christians, but true followers of Jesus Christ, who said, here's the ultimate rebellion, love the Lord thy God with thy whole mind, thy whole heart, thy whole soul, and love thy neighbor as thyself. <laughs> Try that one. <laughs> you want something to rebel against. I want to tell that to Marilyn Manson next time. <laughs> have to interview him. You did. No, I haven't. For some. Yeah. Do, do things like that, uh, the shooting in, in Colorado, does that worry you, or is that just you know, that, is that happening with every generation? I mean, you had it in the '60s, with you know what happened to Sharon Tate. And sure, it was in the '50s too. There were a lot of uh, teenage. Yeah. That's actually that uh, in, sort of cold blood. That, yeah, yeah that, that kind of stuff. That uh, teenage uh, Charles Starkweather. There were guys, there were people in the 50s shooting from a, a Texas tower at the university. A guy knocked out 21 people, I think, something like that. God. And um, America, it happens in America. We have that kind of... And boy, don't ask me where it comes from. It's just an absolute madness. It's an insane, violent, mad country that has marvelous things, but also has that undercurrent of madness. And you know, people just flip out. It's just now that it's gotten younger and younger, the kids are just high school kids doing it. See, there's no way for them to test to to test their manhood. There's no way for them to uh, to to step out of their childhood into their manhood. And those kids were right at the age; those boys were 17 and 18. There should be some real manhood tests for them, and there isn't any. There isn't any in our society. However, back in the 60s, we had one test of your wanting to go into adulthood, trying to get your, to become an adult, and that was called psychedelic substances, LSD. You want your kids, kids having problems? Try some acid. Take this. Go sit by the river. You know, you're in Colorado. Go by a, go out in the forest. They were out in the uh, beautiful suburb. Go in the forest, uh, sit under a tree, take some LSD. You got rage? Oh, really? You're angry? Go sit by a river, go down by the beach, go down by the ocean. Take some LSD. That'll blow it out of you. You'll find out who you are. You're going to get me in so much trouble. <laughs> my mother my mother rang me up yesterday and just said, uh, about that UV40 interview, you're going to bring, bring that stuff home? <laughs> Slam down the phone. <laughs> so God knows what she's going to say to this. To this. Um, Wait a minute. Don't you guys get high here? Yeah, of course. Well, I don't anymore. I mean, I used to drop acid when I was younger. But yeah, I don't mean... Right here. But oh, really? I don't, you know, I mean, 
people in Dublin, people in Ireland smoke. Yeah. Herb, the herb, don't they? Yeah. You're not just all alcoholics. <laughs> you're not just a bunch of lushes, are you? You know, <laughs> your intoxicants uh, go towards other things. Yeah. See, we're actually we're at a very conservative time once again. Yeah. yeah. There is a lot to rebel I'm, against. The reason I'm wearing a suit is because I have to go to court to report on something after this. You what? I don't normally wear a suit at an interview, especially with ah. the doors. I have cool. to go to court to it to. Uh, well, they look murder, murder. very good. I mean, you have your tennies on, don't you? Sort of. Yeah. What? Walking shoes. Mm -hmm. Tennies. Yeah. What do you call those shoes? Shoes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> those are now shoes are hard leather soles. And right. <laughs> I have the same thing on right. walking very around. Good. Okay. Sorry, I was going to ask you about uh, Michael McClure. Yes. Um, That's that a great you, you knew him from... You knew him from well, from the old, yes, from the, uh, from the days with uh, um, The Doors and, and yeah. Beatniks. Uh, well, you know, all that hippie stuff. And I'd always known his poetry. And we got together, um, you know, uh, I met... He was a good friend of Jim's, and I met him occasionally with Jim. And then we got together about ten years ago. I heard him doing a reading... And I was playing the piano with another poet, a friend of mine from Los Angeles, and Michael was reading in L.A., and I said, one of his poems really inspired me, Stanzas in Turmoil, great American poem, it seemed to be like the heartland of America. And then I found out he's from Kansas, I'm from Chicago, so we're familiar with that great, the wheat fields and the azure waves of rain and Purple Mountains, Majesty, and that great heartland, and the sun beating down on the grain, and it's like Aaron Copeland uh, kind of music, and I heard that kind of <clears throat> great C major chords behind this long piece that he was reading, and I said to him, we got to get together, man, Listen, that piece was incredible, what's it called, is it Stances and Turmoil, and he said, I love what you're doing with uh, this other poet, so I said, well, let's just get together, and, you know, and we've been together for the last ten years now, doing wow. it off and on. It just, yeah. you know, it's just a marriage. I mean, it's poet. It's like working with Morrison. It's poetry and music. Yeah. You know, it doesn't change. It's, you know, I'm able to play all kinds of music behind him. It just doesn't have a, a drummer and a guitar player. But other than that, I do exactly the same thing I did with the Doors, except we don't play songs. We, I play his poetry. His poetry. He reads it. And I read it at the same time. He has his words on the little stand, and I have his words on the music stand. So I'm reading his words as he is, oh, and I'm really? playing. Wow. Yeah, I'm not. Okay. You know, I mean, I'm. His words are my music, and I'm improvising and creating to the actual words that are on the music stand for me. Okay, that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, it's a great deal of fun. Yeah. And. Um, after after this came the um, show you're doing now by yourself, how did that come about? Well, through the book. Okay, okay. After I wrote the book, I started out... Then you're in Dublin this week, just as, a, Pardon me? Just as, your, just as your paperback is coming out. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. great, yeah. After doing the book, I did some uh, readings, and then I did some improvised lectures. When the hardback came out in the States... And then one place had a piano, and I started playing the piano and telling Doris stories. And that's how it came about, you know. From, it, it, I mean, it's all been... And, and, uh, and tonight and tomorrow night it will be, a, you know, it's all spontaneous. It's an improvisation, and I know what I'm going to do, and I know what I'm going to say. I know the subjects I'm going to talk about, I just don't know how I'm going to say it. You know, I know the songs I'm going to play, but I don't know what I'm going to play when I'm playing them. So it all came about through the book. Right, right. When you end up in hotels like this, they're like, I don't know, five hundred dollars a night, and they've got pipe music playing on reception and that kind of thing. Do you think, God, what am I doing here? <laughs> no, it's a lot of fun. Okay, I really enjoy it. It's a great chance to meet all kinds of new people. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Meet Doors fans in places I haven't been. So. Right, yeah. I haven't been to Dublin before. It's my first time really? in Dublin, yeah. So. Okay. Marvelous. Marvelous so far. It's uh, changing a lot. Very quickly. That's what I hear, yeah. Yeah, if you go out and just look around the skyline, you just see cranes everywhere. Yeah. It's just... God, you guys are building, aren't you? Yeah. Mm. I don't know if it's such a good thing, you know, but it's uh, certainly happening. 
Yeah, I think I have to do an another interview. Yeah, I know. I, I just, sorry, I didn't want you to delay. I was just waiting for Is he going a to photographer to come back. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, I have some coffee. I wonder where the other interview man is. Well, he doesn't know I'm here. Oh, there, there's no photographer. There's your photographer. I go up and call him. Well, Good. Should we do it here or somewhere? Well, well I, I think he wants to get some, some lights. A little backlight? Would that be all right? Sure, fine. Okay, I'll just call him in. Hey Richie. Sorry, how are you? How are you doing? Good, man. Are you finished your interview? Sorry about that. You are. Yep. Okay. And we're going to take some photos and we're done. Okay. I'll have to snap over to you. And then, how are you? And you Sorry. can snuggle up. Okay. Come on in. So, 